we'll uh, put that online. And uh, Thanks, Terry. there we go. <laughs> so, like I was you got pointing out, voice. Uh, today we will probably be just uh, be doing introductory stuff to kind of set the yeah. groundwork for looking at the book of Revelation. Uh, and then next. Well, we'll see if we get through all of that today, uh, and uh, and then we'll hit chapter one in more depth. Uh, so we're not going to start with the scripture reading quite yet. Uh, I just want to start with, and, and I did this with a Bible study early with the network to give me an idea of where people were starting from. So how would you describe your basic understanding of Revelation? Not, I'm not asking you for the details, right? But as you just think about the book of Revelation, what is your basic understanding of it, just so I know where we're starting from? Cryptic. Cryptic. cryptic yeah. All right, cryptic. A lot of revelation, a lot of prophecy. Held and, and it's important. I mean, mm -hmm. it's all it's important stuff, but kind of have no real clue what's going on, frankly. Okay, so we have cryptic as well as prophecy. Now, this is important, right? Because when we think about revelation, revelation actually combines different types of literature, right? But it is a book that says right up front that it is prophetic. So we have cryptic, we have prophetic, uh, and also uh, not having a clue, right? Which is a fair answer. And the only book that promises a blessing. And it's a book that promises a blessing. That's the only one that says that. Right uh, up front. Yeah, I, I'm trying to uh, not, As far as I know. I mean, in Deuteronomy, you have blessings well, for keeping yeah. and stuff, but it is a book that promises a blessing. And just the way it words it, I guess. Which is a good point because most of our New Testament letters don't start with, hey, here, here's a blessing. You know? You'll be blessed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so what are other thoughts that come to mind with the book of Revelation? Just as a big picture where people are, uh, how you think about it. Spiritual download received by John. A spiritual download received by John. Very good. I've always, I've always kind of avoided it. I've read like maybe a page or two, and then it kind of scared me a little bit, and I got it right out of it, so I'm clueless. All right, uh, which is a fair point. You know, uh, John Calvin wrote lots of commentaries, but uh, avoided the book of Revelation. But if you read the whole thing and you've been through a study, like we have, you find out that it's God's blessed reassurance that we win. So this and this kind of goes along with Don's point, right? It's a book that promises a blessing, right? So if if we are Christians and we're scared of the book of Revelation, then we've missed it somehow, right? Because it, it's not intended to scare believers. We win. Yeah. yeah. So so you know, and honestly, I, I was kind of expecting that to come out. You know, so many people in my life I've heard, you know, I really don't understand Revelation except for it says we win. Yeah. Right. And, and uh that's really how yeah, so many people have framed it for me in the past. But, but it's also a book of warnings for non-Christians. Uh, and it's a book of warnings as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's heavily mistaught. Uh, you know, well, uh, heavily mistaught, I would, I would say one of the things is uh, heavily mistaught and misunderstood by many who would claim to understand it. To have, have the right understanding and you know, Revelation is, is very deeply uh, taught in different ways. Uh, and we're going to get to that with some of our different schools of interpretation as well. So as, you, as we think about the book of Revelation, and, and part of this was, was coming out as well, what type of literature is Revelation? So there's apocalyptic, apocryphal, okay? So that's one. What other type of literature is Revelation? You mentioned it a second ago. Prophecy. Prophecy. Okay. Right? So so we have prophetic and we have apocalyptic, right? Which sometimes the two overlap, but they're not exactly the same. All right? So uh, we'll have apocalyptic uh, prophetic literature in the Old Testament, but not all the prophecies of the Old Testament are apocalyptic. Right? So, so, so those are two different types which overlap at times, but don't always overlap. So we have prophecy and apocalyptic. And what other type of literature is Revelation? Word pictures, that? Uh, word pictures can fit with the apocalyptic. <laughs> uh, so there is figures of speech, symbolism, right? Uh, yeah, uh, symbolic. So, and this is what's important about understanding the apocalyptic nature. Apocalyptic deals with the symbolic. And we have that precedent in the Old Testament. Uh, typical of apocalyptic literature is symbolic language. 
Uh, there's there's one other piece I want to make sure we we grasp before we head out. When you think about uh, Galatians, Hebrews, what are those? Epistles. epistles. Revelation is an epistle. Oh, put the letters to the churches. It's the letters to the churches. I think Lisa wrote a comment okay. about what Revelations is revealing Jesus. Is that what you said? Yeah, the unveiling of Jesus is how we described it in our um, ladies, our Grace Ladies Bible study. I don't know if Joanna's there, but that's how that was our like brief description of the study. Okay, an unveiling of Jesus. Okay. Um, so, so as we think about this book, right, it's a mixture of epistle. And, and John tells us this is written to the seven churches. So we know it's an epistle. It describes itself as a prophecy, uh, but a large swath of it is apocalyptic. Uh, now, Steve Gregg comments, and I quote, uh, and this is from uh, his commentary. Actually, Steve Gregg has a, an excellent commentary on Revelation that's kind of an overview. It's a, I should have brought it with me. Is it four views on Revelation? Uh, I'll, I'll try to bring it with me next week. But he says, uh, quote, apocalyptic means symbolism is the rule. Literalism is the exception. It uses vivid images and symbols to communicate meaning. Uh, and the precedent we have for that is the Old Testament. It's the same way that the Old Testament uses uh, prophetic uh, apocalyptic letter, uh, literature. Now, here's the important question, and this is going to get to what Rich was commenting on a second ago. Why does it matter that we understand what kind of literature it is? If you read it correctly. Absolutely. So you don't take it, don't take what's not meant to be taken literal, literal. Exactly. So when we think about uh, why does it matter? When we talk about the literal, uh, the literal meaning of scripture, we don't mean that you take everything literally. We mean that you interpret it as it was intended to be interpreted. So when Jesus says, I am the door. Look for hinges. Are you looking for hinges? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Uh, when Jesus says, I am the living water, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, right? We understand. I was just gonna say, and that's not meant to be secretive or mysterious in any way. It's meant to be works to, to understand. Like, it, it's not always readily clear, but it doesn't mean that you can't find it without some research and, and looking into the context and the understanding. Now, and, and this is a great point. I'm glad you made that, Amanda, right? Because the symbolism is not to hide the meaning. Yeah. Uh, so so from, from our context, you know, some of us might be like, well, why use all the symbolic? Why not just tell us, you know, X, Y, and Z, right? Uh, but if I were to tell you, you know, it's raining cats and dogs. Well, and, and I mean, he's showing John about things that John may not have a whole lot of understanding about. I mean, if he's showing him things in where it may be hard for him to describe exactly what he's seeing. Uh, well, and we do have, John doesn't understand all the visions. And at points we have John, the visions being explained to him and at points we don't, right? Uh, and so we'll, we'll dive into some of that as we go through. But the point is, is we all use symbolic language all the time. We just don't think about it, right? So if I were to say, it's raining cats and dogs. How would you understand that? Lots of rain. Lots of rain. Lots of rain, right? Uh, if, if I were to, say, uh, be talking about a baseball game and say, he hit it out of the park, what would I be meaning? Oh, my. Now, if, if uh, Rich were to leave church today and say, Dan, you hit it out of the park today, what would he mean? I left church, and I was glad to go. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, right? you, you nailed You nailed. Well, there's another. <laughs> you nailed, you it. nailed it, right? You nailed it. So, so the point is, is we all use symbolic language all the time, and we think nothing of it. The reason why is because we understand the symbolic language that we're using. Right. Now, as we think about Revelation, who is Revelation written to? The seven churches. Seven churches. In the first century. And the seven churches that Revelation is being written to in the first century, they understood the symbolic language. Right? So this is part of the task of Bible study is to understand the context it was written in so that we can understand what it means. Right, so we have to understand what did the language mean to them, so that we can ask what does it mean for us. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so the symbolism is not to make it unclear; it's not to hide it. 
It's because of who it's being written to. And they understand the apocalyptic nature of the language. Uh, for that reason, we are going to be spending a little bit of time as we go through Revelation, looking at the Old Testament, just like we did with the Olivet Discourse. Because where do we find how the symbols are used in the Old Testament? Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> Hank, uh, what was the Hank name? Hanagraph. Hank Hanagraph. Uh, 404 verses in Revelation, two-thirds of them allude to the Old Testament. Yeah. In fact, I've got a, I don't know if we'll get there today, but his, his introduction to that yes. book, I've got it right here because I'm like, I'm reading that. <laughs> right. Once we get to that point in my notes. Uh, and I would just like to add to that. If you read like the book of Zechariah, you think you're reading Revelation in the Old Testament almost with a lot of the visions and the writing. You cannot read that book and if you've ever read any of Revelation, you can't go, wow, I see where John's getting a lot of this from. Yeah, uh, and this is a great point, right? So when we do dive into <laughs> Revelation 1, John is going to draw from Zechariah. He's going to draw from Daniel. He's going to draw from Ezekiel. Uh, let me think. Uh, does he draw? Uh, throughout the book of yeah. Revelation, we're going to see uh, Ezekiel. We're going to see Isaiah. We're going to see Daniel. Yeah. We're going to see the Psalms. We're going to see a plethora of Old Testament that's being used, even though it's never directly cited. Just pointing out, Lisa also said in the chat, there's an excellent study in right numbers. Oh, uh, what's the study in right now media? It's called Revelation. Um, I was in it today. Let me pull it back up here. See who the author was. Um, <laughs> it's Stephen Armstrong. Oh, okay. Yeah, with a PH. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar. Yeah, yeah. just thought I'd bring that up. Yeah, since so we have an account with them. Perfect. So there are uh, resources available right now. Media has some. I, I'm not familiar with them. Um, Obviously, Revelation is going to have different viewpoints, and we're going to we're going to argue our viewpoint. Uh, but uh, but we're going to mention the viewpoints, right? Because we want to be honest with how we address it. Uh, but the point we want to make at this uh, at this stage is we can't understand the Book of Revelation outside of the context that it was written. Two other quick points, um, and this is me personally. Uh, the first one. I believe Revelation was written before the fall of Jerusalem. I believe the entire New Testament was written before the fall of Jerusalem, um, which really changes your interpretation if you view it that way versus when you view it if, if it was written in the 90s. Absolutely. And we are going to talk about right. the dating. Um, and and yeah. the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and the second part about it. Um, one of the things that, it's an incredibly minor point, but I think one of the things that shows how much Christianity changed things is John starts out by saying one Lord's Day, which is literally a Sunday. Um, and the reason I point that out is the emperor started right around the time of Jesus saying, we need to have a day of the month dedicated to me. So it was the emperor's day. So the Christians literally respond by saying every Sunday is the Lord's day. And it shows how quick things change because the Sabbath, if anyone refers to Sunday as the Sabbath, biblically, you're wrong. Right. Because the, the Sabbath was always sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And Sunday is the Lord's and day. And Sunday is the Lord's day. And that's important because for Jewish Christians, which is the bulk of what we're talking about at this time, to change the day they worship is cataclysmic. Yeah, it's one of the evidences for the resurrection. I mean, if you think about an apologetic, right, yes. that would be one of the cumulative evidences is they gave Jesus worship and they started worshiping on a different day. 
but it, it, and but that one little mention is one of the things that really helps position this book as really written by John. Mm -hmm. Is is that one aspect? Is that uh, we don't really know why he was on Patmos for sure, but he makes that statement and it establishes it as a as a real book, not a myth. Absolutely. And, and so so with that, right, uh, when we think about the context of Revelation, the context of Revelation does not depend on our current events. Right. And when you, what, a lot of the stuff that you read out there today, I know, here on the I'm radio. being good and I'm not mentioning names, right? Or here on the radio. At least I'm not at this point. Or here on the radio. They depend on current events and current headlines for their death, for, for understanding Revelation. And what has happened with that is it's changed over and over and over again, right? Because they're looking at headlines, they're making predictions, they're saying this is fulfilling this Revelation passage, and then it doesn't happen. And then it doesn't happen. And then it doesn't happen. And so what we get is we get a bunch of false predictions because they're interpreting Revelation based on our headlines rather than the context of the Old Testament background, right? And we're going to rely heavily on that Old Testament background and understanding. Uh, John assumes, now, uh, we had a great banquet meeting here yesterday, and one of the guys made a, a reference just to the, you know, ask Jonah and the fish. And one of the feedback, part of the feedback we gave him is, you can't assume that they know the story of Jonah, right? That's not the case with John. John assumes you have an understanding of the Old Testament. Yep. Their day and age, they had a much better grasp of their scriptures than what Christians do today of our scriptures, right? John assumes the reader has an understanding of the Old Testament. Uh, Steve Gregg uh, writes, and I quote, the book has been called a rebirth of images since it takes imagery familiar from hundreds of Old Testament passages and it reworks them with new applications. Right, so he's using language and, and he's giving them the meanings to uh, things that they all understand. Kind of like taking trigonometry. I mean, your teacher would assume that you have a basic understanding of arithmetic. Yes, that's Absolutely. a great point. That's a great point. And, and it's and, and along that line, it's also um, what John does with the pictures from the Old Testament is very similar to when Jesus says, "You've heard it said, but I say." Absolutely. He Jesus refers back to what the Old Testament said, and then he updates it with the New Testament view, which is really what John does with, with the imagery here. Exactly. So, And that's why we're going to see what John's going to do. Instead of directly quoting Daniel 7 right. or so here, what he's going to do is he's going to take imagery from Daniel 7, and he's going to combine it with imagery from Zechariah. Right. Right? To see how these images blend together to give us this bigger picture. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so... Uh, there are different schools of interpretation. Uh, interpretation. Do we uh, do we really want to record this? <laughs> there are different schools of interpretation for approaching Revelation, and uh, I'm just going to kind of outline those for you so that you know that they're there. I don't know the uh, the guy on uh, the Right Now Media, so I don't know which school he's on. Uh, First by Verse Ministry International, Steve Armstrong. Eighty-seven sessions of Steve Armstrong. Eighty-seven sessions. Wow. Wow. A lot of challenge has been laid down. Uh, it was uh, Stephen Armstrong, and he's it's published by Verse by Verse Ministry International. And then he passed the, away a couple years ago. I wonder if that's the. How, how does he spell Stephen V or P A P H? What's his name? Mm -hmm. Stephen Armstrong. Uh, so uh, there are different schools of, of, of interpretation, and I apologize. I misspelled historicism on your sheet. It is spelled right on mine because, yes, I made myself a teacher's guide, and I gave you guys. I'm not giving you guys all the answers. you got to do a little work and write down some notes, right? Uh, so uh, uh, like Steve Gregg uh, lies, lays this out, uh, I assume R.C. Sproul does and some other scholars, you know, if they, if they really want you to understand why you get some of the different interpretations. So uh, there was one school of, of thought uh, in terms of interpretation called historicism. And this group understood Revelation as an overview of history presenting a chronological unfolding of history. So uh, 
So they would look at the seven churches as representing periods of time throughout history. Uh, and in fact, when we did our uh, campus crusade internship in Florida, there was a pastor that we really liked his teaching on Sunday morning, and we bought his revelation for things he was doing on Sunday night because he, he uh, uh, we couldn't do the Sunday night, and he was going through revelation, and we thought, well, that's interesting. So we bought, and you know, this is how old it was. It was on cassette tapes. <laughs> Uh, he was of the school of historicism. I wish I had known that before we bought the tapes, right? Uh, but but he laid out as revelation, as unfolding history throughout time, uh, throughout, uh, and, and um, so we have periods of history being reflected in Revelation. Now, to be honest, most people have abandoned that view at this point because uh, history continues to go on and it gets harder and harder to match it with periods of history. Uh, so it is one of the uh, schools of interpretation that have been out there, but mostly it's been abandoned uh, at this point in time. Uh, what most people are familiar with, and I was surprised that this didn't come up when I asked, what is your big understanding? Yes, futurism. And the, the school of thought with futurism basically holds that most of Revelation is still future, right? They might give you that chapters one through three pertain to seven churches, but after chapter three, the church is out of here. And chapter four on is stuff all all we're still waiting for. I blame the Demi Moore movie. The Demi Moore movie? Seven Signs. Seven Signs, yeah. Well, for anybody that likes the author, John MacArthur, he write, wrote a book called Because the End is Near. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jeff just ordered a bunch of those for the prison ministry because we've had it requested. Oh, and yeah. It's, it's about the record, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I'll be honest, there are some people that I like on most everything except for eschatology. Yep. Uh, and and uh, uh, eschatology is a study of the end times, of the last days. Uh, and, and so I have nothing against uh, particular individuals, right? But, uh, but popular among the people is futurism. Right? The idea that, and this is where your John MacArthur's at, this is where your David Jeremiah's at. Now I'm mentioning names. Uh, uh, Guzik is at, uh, and and I love them on other yep. things. Jay Vernon McGee. Uh, Jay Vernon McGee. If you have the Moody Bible Commentary, which yep. I which I really like as a quick resource, except for on eschatology, uh, they have this the futurism. They hold that you know chapter four, the church is out of here, and it's all future stuff. Okay. Uh, now as we go through, uh, you know. Our task, right, as we go through a study of Revelation, is to, to give you the reasons for where we stand. Uh, and that's what we're going to do, right? And uh, our task as well is to support where we stand through Scripture, right? And which makes best sense of the Scripture and, and so on. So that's going to be our goal. Well, and I think the best study on Revelations is reading Revelations and, and praying for God to open, you know, send his Holy Spirit to, to open your understanding. I, I partly agree and partly disagree. The best study of Revelation. Right. I, I'm, I'm going to partly agree and partly disagree. So, so Terry said the best study of Revelation is just reading the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. So I, I and praying for understanding and praying for understanding. And, and I agree to it that uh, much better. You know, so many people will read what everybody else says about it and never read the book itself. Uh, right. The part that I would disagree with is is you're not going to understand Revelation if you don't understand the imagery, and the imagery comes from the Old Testament. That's true. So uh, I don't remember who it was, but when I did like the Revelation series of what, 2014, uh, I remember one of the guys that I read said, if you want to understand, if you have nine months to study Revelation, spend the first six months in the Old Testament. Yeah. Because it's the Old Testament imagery that gives you the background for the, for Revelation. So, so uh, I, I say, I say that knowing that, you know, that you've already studied the Old Testament. <laughs> okay, so you know. so if, if you've already got that imagery down from the Old Testament, right. then absolutely. I um, think with I think with me, I just read some of it. I think I actually read more more than I said because I kind of breezed through it, and I remember what bothered me. You know, it said with you know a beast coming out with seven heads and that kind of stuff. I decided at that point I would rather learn it instead of interpret it wrong. I'd rather learn it in a Sunday school or yeah, something that's a fair, like that. 
That's a fair point. Yeah. And, and that would be an example of apocalyptic symbolic language, right? Right. And, and we will, uh, when we get to the beast, we will definitely deal with the beast in a biblical way. Uh, and and uh, now when we think about the futurist viewpoint, uh, what context do they read the book of Revelation in? Just like a literal. So, okay, so they would say they read it literally, even though they take symbolically some of the literal language. Right. I don't even know so, if they take that much symbolically. Uh, so, so no, no. So so they would read the sun being darkened as literal, right? But they would take symbolic the time is near. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. So the statements that are made more literally, they take symbolically, and the statements that are meant more symbolically, they take more literally. Yeah. Right. And, and at the same time, they claim to be the only ones who read it literally. Correct. So, uh, but they're, the, they're they're the ones that in uh, the Olivet Discourse. Before uh, this generation shall not pass, they they're the life. ones that take generation and convert it to race. They make it symbolic. <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. Even though they say they're the only ones that read it literally. Whereas everywhere else it's used, it, that Greek word is used as a human generation. Yeah. So uh, the futurists read Revelation out of the context of our headlines. Right. Instead of the context of the Old Testament. Uh, so th as a general point, right? So they're the ones that are looking at, hey, what's happening in Israel today? They're the ones that look at, hey, earthquakes are happening across. Well, wait a minute. Wait, there's, a there's always been war. earthquakes. There's always been wars, right? But they are the ones that read Revelation out of the context of our headlines rather than the Old Testament. And then you have the preterist view. Uh, and not everybody's on the same page in the camp of preterism. So you have to define... Uh, what they mean by preterism. Uh, but preterism sees Revelation as a future prophecy because it was written before 70 AD. So it's a future prophecy of what the Olivet Discourse was speaking of, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And so uh, Revelation is written uh, as a future prophecy for them, but it's past history for us. So it's already happened. Now, where you get some debate among preterists is how much of it has already happened and what we're still waiting for. You do have some that are extreme who take the second coming of Jesus as just a spiritual coming, uh, which is not what the biblical teaching is. Uh, uh, but you don't have to have revelation for that, right? We could get that from other passages of scripture as well. Uh, and then you have, uh, and you have some preterists that say uh, it's completely fulfilled with 70 A.D., you have some that would say it's fulfilled in 70 AD and the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, and then you have, uh, so you have some variances in the camp. But, but basically, Revelation is future for them, past for us. And then you have another school of interpretation. Uh, why am I looking up there? Because I have all my notes here. <laughs> Makes me feel like a teacher, right? The point you look like a life. weatherman. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. And today's weather, yeah. cold, cold, and more cold. <laughs> Uh, the other uh, school of interpretation is idealism. I think it's also called spiritualist, uh, but I could be wrong on that. But I think they use both terms. Uh, and they look at Revelation as a symbolic battle between good and evil uh, throughout time. So it's not tied to anything historic, right? It's just this uh, symbolic picture of this battle between Christ and Satan, good and evil throughout time without being tied to any particular time. I just thought. Oh, okay. I, I, I just, I knew you were saying something. Uh, so uh, from this camp, basically they'd be looking at it, and, and we really see this with the churches as well, is, uh, you know, the greatest danger is compromise with the world, right? And, and so the book of Revelation is about not compromising with the world, being identified with Christ rather than identified with the beast. Uh, and, and that's a, you know, and that would be a biblical point. Don't compromise with the world, right? But that would be that view. And then, of course, there are people that just, you know, because we're talking in general, general picture here, uh, there are some that kind of have a mixture of the viewpoints together, right? So you might get, you know, a mixture of one or two of the above at different points and how people read certain points of it, right? That's just a kind of a general picture. Is there any questions on that? Or does that make sense? We, we don't want to move forward if we don't understand this point. It's like a lot of gymnastics for some of these. I am opposed to exercise, so 
<laughs> what? We learned that about you last yes. week. I didn't hear what she said. You want to repeat it for? I said it sounds like a lot of gymnastics for some of these, and I am opposed to exercise. <laughs> so uh, there is a lot of gymnastics, right? And there's a lot of uh, fanciful imagination, right? So for instance, uh, if you were to read some in the futurist camp, uh, what they would say is, well, John's describing things that he couldn't understand in his day, but we can understand them in our day. And so the scorpions <laughs> with all these pictures are like uh, uh, Black Hawk helicopters, Cobra helicopters. Uh, and so, I mean, that is fanciful imagination. There, it is possible that there were things that he saw that he could not understand, but that is, that is, yeah. So what's interesting is we jump to that conclusion there, but they're using bows and arrows in other places. Yeah. So, uh, so we got on. We, we got to think about. Okay, I, actually, one of the comments I'm making in the sermon today. Uh, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and make it here too. Oh, good. I can leave after you. Talk yeah. Me. Is uh, <laughs> and, uh, I've actually got a little section in the scripture today that's that has our Revelation series in mind. But I'm talking about the Good Shepherd, which is also figurative language, right? And, and uh, one of the points that I make is symbolic language leaves room for interpretation, but the interpretation still has to fit in the room, right? So there may be more than one way to see it, but it still has to fit the context. Cobra helicopters don't fit the context, okay? Uh, sometimes fanciful imagination just leaves the room, right? So while there might be room for interpretation, that doesn't mean every root to interpretation has possibilities. Maybe it's a flying boat. Maybe it's the flying boat. Now, now here's, what's, here's what's really I'm interesting hoping. about Revelation, okay? Uh, and uh, I picked this up from... Uh, Maybe it was Gentry or no, I, I've done a little bit of reading here and there, right? So things kind of blend. Uh, but but there's a there's a big irony when we think about how most people view the point of the book of Revelation today, because what's the definition of revelation? Revealing. 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 Yeah. Apple. Understand? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Good choice. The definition of revelation is revealing, unveiling, something that was mysterious now being made known. Huh. So here we have a book that claims to be a revealing, an unveiling. That's what I was meaning before when I said it's like a spiritual download to John. It was the spirit revealing to him things to come, things that he would not otherwise know about maybe like, you know, heaven. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it doesn't make any sense. Why, why, would, why would this angel reveal this stuff to John? For him not to make any sense of it, to not understand what he's saying. Well, the point we're going to make is they did understand. We're the ones that don't understand. We don't. Because, but I they, because yes. they understood the language exactly. and the type of literature. Yeah. We, Our first task is we have to understand the language and the literature so that we can understand because they have a knowledge that we're not starting with. The <clears throat> Along the lines of what Amanda and Don are saying, um, what's being revealed? Who who wants to write a book in biblical times where God's saying, this is not for you, this is for people at least 2,000 years from now? And then tell them how blessed they're going to be when they read it. Yeah, you're blessed for reading this, but it doesn't mean and, anything for you. And, um, and also uh, tell them about how Everyone's going to see Jesus coming, even the ones who pierced him, even though they're they're dust by that time. This this is the thing that jumps out to me, especially just in the first chapter, is Christians were not caught in Jerusalem. They were gone. They were gone because of what Jesus said, and they were gone because of points like this in Revelation. God is being very serious with his people. He doesn't want them caught there. And, and if you're in Jerusalem, odds are you're a Jew or a Messianic Jew, let's say. And those are the ones who weren't caught there. And if you, if, if you just overlook that completely, which you have to come up with these other ones, I don't think you're being honest. Go ahead. And, and that was... A catalyst for spreading the gospel. Absolutely. Maybe yeah, so. absolutely. So, so, uh, 
And with these, as, as we read through Revelation, we're going to look at the context that was written, the people that was written, uh, but we actually also have historians of the time that will help us understand the context that, that yes. fits amazingly well with what we're reading in Revelation. And they're not Christian. Exactly. So uh, uh, a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus uh, uh, describes a lot that of what happened in 70 that matches uh, very nicely, yes. very nicely, to use it loosely, right, with things that we read about in Revelation. But you also have uh, Roman historians like Tacitus. You have uh, Pliny. Uh, you have uh, the elder. Uh, the elder. Uh, so, uh, so, so as we go through, uh, and, and actually, uh, Kenneth Gentry does a, uh, a remarkable amount of work looking oh at some of the, of the history. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, "Before Jerusalem Fell." It's like uh, probably about this thick, uh, making the case. You know, you heard Rich earlier comment about the dating, right? He writes a book this thick to argue for early date for Revelation. Uh, speaking of, which I think is our next question, you know, what do scholars look at for dating a book? What's in the text? So they look at what's in the text. So they look at internal evidence mm -hmm. and they look at external evidence. You know, and sometimes, you know, like if you uh, if you're looking at a study Bible or a commentary, they'll say date and authorship. Uh, sometimes they have a pretty good idea of a date. Sometimes they give you a range. Uh, sometimes, like the book of Joel, they'll say, here's a range here and here's a range here because they're trying to look at internal and external evidence. Some books don't really have very good internal evidence for dating. Others do. Like Isaiah, which says, uh, in the year of King right. Isaiah. It's like, hey, that's very helpful. Yeah. Right? That would be internal evidence. Uh, external evidence. Most people that date Revelation with a late date rely on external evidence, not internal evidence. And the external evidence that most of them use is a quote from Irenaeus. Who, Gen was, who was? Who was one of the church fathers uh, in the um, second century. Right. Almost everybody who gives it a late date falls back and traces back to one quote from Irenaeus. And, and he's not a universal voice. I think Clement actually mentions an earlier date. So right. we have external evidence for the other. Uh, the problem is, and Gentry covers this in his book, uh, that quote that they take to give it a late date is actually ambiguous. Right. Right. So everybody takes it in one direction, but it's actually ambiguous in terms of what he's referring to. Uh, and so uh, it's not very good. It's not a good foundation for dating. Uh, and yet almost every late date depends on that quote from Irenaeus. Uh, Gentry makes an excellent, like I said, it's a book like this thick for an early dating uh, to the point that Rich was making earlier. Uh, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple. This is an argument from Silence, but it screams. Yes. If the temple was destroyed and we have New Testament books written after that fact, do we really think they wouldn't refer to, hey, look at this prediction Jesus made? By the way, guess who got this right? Exactly. Uh, and incidentally, we do have internal evidence in Revelation 11 that refers to the temple. Right. So your futurist viewpoint is there it's has to be a rebuilt temple. <laughs> Yeah. Because it's got to be destroyed again. It's good. Yeah, which doesn't make any sense. Right. Is that Where, why they're working feverishly to rebuild all the tools and things? Allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so the futurist view demands that a temple be rebuilt, uh, even though, uh, well, we'll just say uh, it's not happened to this point, right? Right. Uh, but the reality would be is. What's the likelihood that it wouldn't have referred to the destroyed temple if it was written in the late date? Uh, and uh, there's a far more evidence for it being written uh, in, during the time of Nero, before the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, you have internal and external evidence that supports that viewpoint much more strongly than you do the later date. One of the things that Hannah Graf points out is the 666. If you take Nero's name, in the ancient Greek, and you do the numbering, it comes out 666. But in the Latin trans, the early Latin translations, it's 616, which is Nero's name numerically represented in Latin. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's, there's things like that that you just, okay, 
Does one of those things say this is it? No, but it's it's the confluence. It's the it's the fact that there's a lot of little things that point to it, whereas the other crowd is going, well, look what Irania said over here. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and absolutely, on. there there's a far more cumulative yes. evidence for the for the early date uh, than the latter, and, and uh, so to the point that Rich was making there, right? So. You have the original language that it matches up with Nero. You have a, a copy in Latin that matches up with Nero. Now, the other thing that comes out in that chapter, and we'll dive into it more, uh, was that Revelation 13, is uh, he actually says to the audience he's writing, let those who have wisdom calculate the number of the beasts, and it is right. 666. Now, that has the assumption and the presumption that they're able to figure out who he is. It's not mystery. Not right. a mystery, right? Uh, so if we think about, well, 2,000 years down the road, and actually, you know, Hitler, Stalin, right. Ronald Reagan, right? Wasn't Ronald Reagan? Oh, I mean, sure. People have come up with all sorts oh, yeah. of, of names to associate with the number 666 and done their gymnastics to make it work. Whereas we have an early figure who fits the definition and let us calculate, let who has wisdom calculate the number of the beast. Assumes the readers would be able to figure out who he is. The seven churches would have known that. Exactly. Uh, and so what, what many people don't realize or may not realize is uh, in their language. Uh, so if I were to give you the Roman numeral X, what number does that represent? It's 10. Yeah. So their alphabet served doubly as, as their right. mathematics as their numbers. Right. We have, we have our alphabet. We have our numbers. For them, it was one and the same. It did double duty. So when they're talking about calculating the number of the beast, right, those those numbers also go along with the letters. And that's what uh, Rich was saying with Nero's name fits it in both the Hebrew as well as in the Latin manuscripts. Right. Or the Greek, the ancient Greek. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, yep, I'm sorry. Uh, Hebrew uh, uh, revelation is written in Greek, right. but it's written from a Hebrew mindset. Correct. Which actually makes it pretty <laughs> ugly Greek at times. Yes. Uh, which probably also serves part of John's purpose, but that's a... Well, and the other thing is, is um, I believe there's a lot that points back to the Septuagint as well in Revelation. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I think at this point, considering the time, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stop and and just make sure we have questions, clarifications, and then we'll hit our preliminary snapshot uh, because uh, we're gonna want to read all these together. Uh, so we will uh, pick up with the preliminary snapshot next week and make sure that we don't leave people with questions this week. So uh, anybody have any questions? Have we muddied any waters or is this being helpful? I hope. Looks like everybody's gone. Yeah. <laughs> you think it's helpful? You got more online. Yeah, I think it's helpful. 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 All right. I'm so far. <laughs> Very helpful. <laughs> yeah, 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 this is, yeah, this is yeah, easy. For Debbie's going to be able to teach us after we're, we're done with this. We'll be able to teach us. This. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we will do is, uh, you know, we'll try to make our arguments from scripture. We'll show how history and different things support it. Uh, what, what I can tell you is, uh, uh, I'm not in the futurist camp. What? I, I, I'm not in the futurist camp. Uh, I uh, uh, and, and what I can also tell you is, uh, you know, 20 years ago I would have been. Yep. And yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm throwing out the yeah. So 20 years ago I I would have been in the futurist camp, and uh, what changed my mind was I studied Revelation. Uh, and you know, scripture. yeah, one of the things that I've told you time and time again, you can change my mind if you do it from scripture. And uh, when I preached through Revelation, uh, I changed my mind because I was studying scripture. And what I saw was a lot of people mishandling scripture. Along those lines, there's in the Gospels, there's a lot of history that supports what's in the gospel. I would argue there is as much history that supports the partial preterist view of Revelation as there is that supports that Jesus actually lived, died, and was resurrected. 
Yeah. More so than any of the other views. Uh, it, it's been, oh, so uh, this is a book uh, much smaller than Before Jerusalem Fell, written by Kenneth Gentry. Uh, it is not a detailed commentary, uh, but if you're really interested, uh, it's called The Book of Revelation Made Easy. You can understand Bible prophecy. This is kind of like a big aerial perspective view, uh, which is making the case for the preterist view of Revelation. Now, uh, partial preterist. I, I, actually, what I would say is, is Gentry is a partial preterist, right? right? So he's been charged with being a full preterist, uh, which denies the literal bodily return of Christ. Uh, he's actually written another book arguing against that view entirely, right? So he's a partial preterist in the sense that he said, we, we still believe Jesus is coming back in bodily form. However, he sees the whole book of Revelation as the destruction of Jerusalem, I think. He, he gets these physical return from other passages of scripture, but he'll read all of Revelation as a spiritual. Well, uh, I, I, can, I can see where he says that. The only one little problem I would have with that was the fact as, as the New Jerusalem, that part of Revelation. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll get there when we get there, right? So, and, and this is going to be, you know, uh, this is going to be the challenge, right? Where right. we get to some of it, right? And, and we're going to be looking at what best fits mostly, but that doesn't mean we're going to understand everything completely. Uh, but, as, but as I read through this, because I kind of thought that too, I, I, I really think uh, Gentry is, Revelation is entirely done with what happened, uh, but he's not denying a physical return of Christ. He's just looking at other passages to defend it and not revelation. Uh, I won't argue that one. Yeah, yeah. So it's like what the great theologian Ron Kennedy said. This is the easy stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Right here. This is the easy stuff. But but if you this this really uh presents the big picture, you know, not to say you would understand all the details, but but you know, the case for the early dating, the case for Nero being the beast. The case for uh, how we understand the language, uh, the apocalyptic nature of it, uh, just a very handy little guidebook. Uh, generally, I'm I'm open to loaning out books, but I'm holding on to it till we're done with the study. So <laughs> you'll have to wait if you want my copy of it. Oh, Maybe. the Revelation, the Book of Revelation, made easy by Kenneth Gentry. And I will say. I was sitting beside him as he was reading portions of it. When Dan underlined seriously, he goes, "Wow, that was really good." <laughs> no, it's then, you know it's a good book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will also. I'm. I'm assuming and asking the question to see. Um, we are going to dive into some of the history that backs up some of the, like pointing to Nero and everything, because that's one thing that that just blows my mind is when people look at Revelation and they think, oh my goodness, the way that the world is right now, we have to be coming to the end of days. <laughs> It was so much worse then. Oh, than absolutely. Now. That's, so a great, that's a great point. It was terrible. So uh, just, you know, spoilers to give it away. Uh, Roman historians referred to Nero as a beast. Yes. Roman historians referred to Nero as a beast. He was so tyrannical in the things that he did and the activities he did. So, I mean, we read the language in Revelation of the beast. Roman historians actually referred to Nero as uh, that term. Uh, so they referred to him as a beast, as the ender of human civilization. Uh, and, uh, of course, Josephus and others had, you know, things to say. But but Roman historians use that language themselves. Which, which, of, which of makes Nero. sense. Which makes sense. That means the seven churches would have understood all that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. And this and, and this is the hardship. Right. Right. We have to get into the mind of the original readers if we want to understand it as they understood it. So, any other thoughts, questions, comments as we close up? Yeah. All right. Uh, well, we will continue with our overview uh, next week, just kind of laying some of the groundwork. And uh, if we get through the overview, we'll start looking at more details in chapter one. But I want to make sure that we have the, the groundwork in place uh, uh, first, because, you know, that you have to have the foundation before you can start building upon it. So anybody want to uh, close us up with a prayer? <clears throat> Father, we come before you and we. 
we thank you for your word. We praise you that your word is not esoteric, yeah. that your word is not something that we should be afraid of, but that your word is truth, right. and that through it, as we study it, we come closer to you. Mm-hmm. Father, I uh, ask your spirit upon network today, and upon the uh, worship, and upon the uh, message from Dan. Uh, and Father, I just, yeah. again, I thank you for the opportunity to study and delve yeah. deeper and yeah. understand that there's nuance, that there is a, a purpose to why you write to us, to why you have this word written. Not so we can be confused, but so that we can believe you are who you are. That you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we just thank you and praise you for this. And we pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope we're getting off to a good start. I feel like it was a good start anyway. Yeah. But I might be biased. You wrote, you wrote it. I might be biased. <laughs> <laughs>